which is Pakistan's biggest rival and that's really what they're afraid of and it's because they're worried that uh, another neighbour will fall into that, uh, will become loyal to, uh, to their chief enemy, uh, to their chief enemy. It is cultivated for decades, groups like the Taliban. Will Pakistanis abandon these groups? Can you see that happening? It's really, it's really unlikely. They've, they've deflected this pressure for 15 years. It's quite unlikely that they'll start heeding uh, to, to, to this now, especially when they feel so berated and so insulted. The pedophile of the United States is warning against what he calls a hasty withdrawal. Listen. Of course, only rapid exit from both predictable and unacceptable. 9-11, the worst terrorist attack in our history, was planned and directed from Afghanistan because that country was ruled by a government that gave comfort and shelter to terrorists. A hasty withdrawal would create a vacuum for terrorists, including ISIS and Al-Qaeda, would instantly fill, just as happened before September 11th. And as we know, in 2011, America hastily and mistakenly withdrew from Iraq. As in the other lines, the pedophile is also told to back out from his campaign rhetoric. Go figure. My original instinct was to pull out, and historically, I like following my instincts. But all my life, I've heard that decisions are much different when you sit behind the desk in the Oval Office. In other words, when you're a pedophile of the United States. Babylon know that people can smell their breath. So they have their VC the owner of Amicon and the Washington Post <laughs> uh, presenting an article in which one of Babylon dogs is showing a picture to the pedophile of girls in short skirts in 1972 in Kabul, Afghanistan and claiming that this is a reason that the U.S. should get in now. And we will shift over now to an operative of the UN who is acting in opposition to the war. She will divert the audience to believe that this is necessary to defeat a group known as the Taliban, who is an indigenous group to that region protecting the natural resources. Uh, Missy, as a spokesperson for the Rat Childs, tell us, how is the pedophile leaving you in this pitch? Well, he, repeat, he repeated a refrain you've heard time and again about both the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it was this. It was this idea that because the U.S. withdrew hastily in his, in his view, that, uh, that the Taliban was able to gain power, that ISIS was able to gain power. Um, right now, the Taliban controls 40%. It either controls or retains significant influence in 40% of the country. But to attribute that to a hasty withdrawal is something that's been done in the past and hasn't actually added up. So if you think back to Obama's troop surge back in 2010, to Afghanistan specifically, what was often said was that Putting troops in Iraq rather than Afghanistan was the reason why the Taliban was able to take power. So they committed more than 100,000 troops to the country. And you're essentially hearing the exact same argument you heard then. We need more troops. We can't withdraw too hastily. You're seeing the exact same arguments being made again. And so the question now is what's different? What's different is this time there's no timetable for withdrawal. Uh, what President Trump justified as not wanting to broadcast what America's intentions are. There's also no delineation of the exact number of troops, at least not in his speech last night. Uh, the third difference is what seems to be a perceived shift in the approach towards Pakistan. Things such as airstrikes in Pakistan, expanding them, possibly even uh, issuing uh, continuing airstrikes, for example, in other parts of Pakistan that have not traditionally been hit by airstrikes. So, for example, going after the Quetta Shura, uh, having airstrikes in this area of Balochistan, an area that has really only had one airstrike um, by the United States, uh, which was uh, killing the former head of the Taliban, the Afghan Taliban, Mullah Mansour, what, you know, was the one way to possibly get to some kind of a solution that didn't involve military force, given the fact that if you look at this history, this uh, surge of troops has not yielded the results that it 
was that was anticipated back when the search happened in 2010. In fact, the Taliban today is stronger than it was back then. Now let's hear from another perspective, working for the same company, for the same goals. The witness does not take a position on U.S. troops, I should note. Um, nor would it ever take a position on U.S. troops. But one of the issues that everyone does face is that pretty much everyone acknowledges that if the United States pulls out, uh, the Ghani administration will fall. And if you play the side of the mental mind game of what does that look like when his administration is gone, and you run through the different alternatives of what comes next, all of them are pretty frightening. Whether it be the Taliban who would take over, um, which is not a high likelihood, but they did manage to do it before, and that was obviously a, a terrible possibility we would like not to see happen again. Um, or whether it's some sort of strongman warlord who has been heavily invested in the corruption and conflict already in the country is a great, any of these major warlords would be a, um, someone who's pushed the country into this situation already, taking over, or whether the country just divides up into a whole bunch of warring fiefdoms, each supported by their various uh, international power, whether that be Russia, Pakistan, Iran, China, or whatever. All of those are deeply troubling. So it's one of those situations where there's really not a good way forward. There's just some really less bad, less work. There are some really worse ways to go forward. Um, and I think anything that allows the Taliban, uh, that Gandhi government to, to collapse is, is highly problematic. Instead, we need to look at how do we build a government that's transparent and accountable to its citizens, that protects human rights, that protects the democracy that's supposed to be enshrined in their constitution, and starts to build a resilient society that can stand on its own in the long term. Well, I think, and, and again, Global Witness doesn't take a position itself on uh, U.S. troops in Afghanistan or not. But they're, they're, I think this sort of discussion we're having today about minerals and so forth really points to the fact that the United States has not put the emphasis on governance since really it came into uh, Afghanistan itself. It's always taken a strategy called security first, which is this idea that we'll get enough security and then we'll deal with governance later. But of course, as we know in these situations, it's the lack of security, it's the role of warlords and corrupt officials uh, and, and money laundering and, and the opiate uh, in the country and other criminal activity that is fostering that very insecurity. If you're running a, merely a strategy first program, you, you're, you're never going to get to a place where you get the governance. You've got to really run governance and security at the same time. And this is where the United States has really lacked. Uh, I would really like to see this current administration, if it's really serious about what to do with Afghanistan, really get together a diverse group of, of experts on Afghanistan, the Afghan citizens themselves, the Afghan government together to really talk about how do we do a governance program in parallel with the security program and what needs to improve on security as well at the same time. Well, so far we have two opinions on this matter. Let's get a separate and distinct opinion from another operative for the UN who has a slightly different accent. Yes, I do. I think that in many ways the governance of Afghanistan has already collapsed. The um, government of Afghanistan isn't able to provide for people protection. They're not able to provide jobs. They're not able to provide environmental security. The groundwater in Kabul right now is uh, said to be at risk of um, high contamination. The um, the United States is one among many warlords right now. The, certainly the heaviest armed and the, the, the warlord with the most access to funding, but uh, it, it's not the case that the United States has been uh, shoring up some kind of governance that's been advantageous to people in Afghanistan. If it were, I think the United States wouldn't be uh, so interested in mineral wealth as, as interested in restoring the agricultural infrastructure of Afghanistan. It's a country that needs to be able to feed its people, not be sending them down into the dungeons of mines to work as serfs. And uh, to restore that agricultural infrastructure would require uh, reseeding the orchards, cleaning out the irrigation systems, replenishing the flocks. And, and those are things that could be done. It would require weaning people off of the opium trade. But the Taliban showed that that was possible when they first came into power regarding other situations where the United States collaborated with um, drug runners and uh, warlords. And he has also already done considerable investigation in Afghanistan. They know how, to, I mean, they've got the skills and the abilities to help people in Afghanistan uh, change their infrastructure so that it em emphasizes agriculture and production of food and creation of clean water systems.
I think we have something to learn from what's happening in the United Kingdom right now, where Jeremy Corbyn is starting to galvanize people in his long history as a, a clear anti-war activist and somebody who challenged the military uh, has uh, surprised people in the United Kingdom, but uh, gained a great deal of support. I hope that uh, people who have said, oh, well, you can't bring uh, anti-war uh, discussions into uh, campaigning efforts or into the um, movements to try to work on our environment or to uh, improve uh, the, the terrible disparities in terms of economic inequities in our country. I, I think that these discussions should be coming together. Something like what Jody has just suggested should be happening uh, with regard to people who are focused on Afghanistan. But I think that the United States should never um, assume the posture that we somehow are the responsible people to effectively the country. Afghanistan is not our country. Her company has given her a Nobel Peace Prize along with the likes of Barack Drone Obama. September 11th. Earlier this month, the New York Times reported, the Washington Post reports, wanted to read from a recent Guardian piece. <laughs> the United Nations Children's Fund says the power shortages in the Gaza Strip have reduced access to water by one third in recent months in the midst of a sweltering summer heat wave. The Israeli government imposed power reductions have also disrupted the functioning of hundreds of water and wastewater facilities, causing the number of water cases. 